Hello, and welcome back. Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. I'm happy you're still here. We've covered a lot of ground and we've come a long way in the first part of this lecture, looking at organisms, how we study them, their development, morphogenetic fields, mechanistic explanations, their limitations when it comes to the agency and the organization of a whole cell, living cell or living organism. And now we're gonna sort of shift focus from inside the organism to outside. What are the consequences of these processes, um, the organization of the organism, its agency on evolutionary um, theory? And in this first module, we're gonna dive right in by looking beyond the core of evolutionary theory, evolution by natural selection, and look at a few aspects of evolutionary theory that are often not counted as sort of within this core, but are absolutely essential for understanding evolutionary processes. One of them is of course, uh, the source of phenotypic variation, the substrate of natural selection. Where does this variation come from? Is it really random at the phenotypic level or is there some sort of directionality? That's very important to decide how much work is natural selection actually doing uh, in evolution apart from the topic of, of drift and, and random evolution, which we will not go into very much um, uh, in this module. We're gonna look at a topic that's connected to this source of phenotypic variation. How do you get innovation, novelty in evolution? We're gonna look at this from a complexity theory standpoint um, in particular, and then uh, at the end of this module, we're going to look at organisms at aid, as agents and the direct consequences this has for an evolutionary theory. If we take the organism serious again, if we put it at the center of evolutionary theory again, what kind of consequences does this have for our thinking about evolution? And also, what kind of consequences does that have in a more philosophical sort of manner on how we explain evolutionary phenomena? So this whole second part of the lecture is, is motivated uh, by this quest of moving beyond genetic determinism, which is very strong in molecular genetics, developmental genetics, but even stronger maybe in evolutionary genetics still. So we want to move beyond that because as Evelyn Fox Keller writes in the, her beautiful book, The Century of the Gene, written in the year 2000, she writes, it seems evident that the primacy of the gene is the core explanatory element of biological structure and function is more of a feature of the 20th century than it will be of the 21st. She calls the 21st century the century of the organism, and I really hope that she is right. So let's look at evolutionary theory and what it would be like if we would take organisms serious again. And I'm gonna criticize a lot of existing evolutionary theory here because I put these lectures on YouTube as well. I wanna make a few points. If you've come here to find arguments against evolution in general, then you're in the wrong place. Evolution as a phenomenon, evolution as a theory is as robustly established as any scientific knowledge ever gets. There is a ton of independent evidence from all kinds of different sources that supports the fact that evolution is happening. And also, I believe, of course, I'm an evolutionary biologist, that the best way of getting a better understanding of evolution is to look at it scientifically, philosophically, and critically. Okay, so we're gonna take a lot of arguments apart. But the main thing to note here is that evolution isn't wrong. Evolutionary theory doesn't always match the rich, uh, you know, variety of phenomena that we see and want to explain. So we need to diversify the theory to get a better understanding of evolution. We don't need to replace it with anything because its core is completely fine. Okay, and so let's look at this core of evolutionary theory. And the first thing I want you to notice is that evolution as a process really consists of two different sub-processes. And the first one is 
phylogenesis. This is what we talk about when we talk about evolution in the narrow sense. And is also what um, Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, is mostly about. Here's a beautiful sketch that he made in his notebook. It's the first indication that he's thinking about evolution in this sort of tree-like manner. He writes, I think, and draws a phylogenetic tree with what we assume are different species here at the endpoints of the tree and a root down here. Beautiful drawing. So this process happening at the population level, diverging species, you get different uh, organisms, different forms in, in biology, is one side of the, the coin of evolutionary theory. The flip side of the coin, of course, is ontogenesis, development that produces the variation, the substrate that natural selection works on. And what's important to notice here is that what is actually evolving are life cycles, not just developmental processes. You need to reproduce in a manner that you generate offspring that is similar to yourself and they can go on and so on and so on. So this is a sort of closure that's different from the organizational closure of the organism. We'll come back to this issue later on. And it's important. If you don't have this, there is no evolution. It's important to have variation, we'll see that in a minute, but it's also important to have this uh, continuity inheritance for evolution to happen. And this is absolutely essentially dependent on ontogenesis, which I will use, if I use this term ontogenesis, I include metabolic processes, physiological, cellular processes, and developmental processes, behavior at some point even, um, everything that contributes to this successful closure of a life, life cycle and the produ uh, production of, of progeny or offspring. And so these two different processes, they happen at very different timescales. One happens within a generation, the other one happens exclusively, more or less, um, between generations, okay? And so Ernst Meyer, in this very famous 1961 paper where he also introduces the term uh, of the genetic program, uh, argues that you can cleanly separate the two. Basically what's happening is that you have different types of causes in biology. So he says, on one hand, they're proximate causes. They explain how does something come about. Developmental biology, physiology, how is a trait generated? Okay, so the function of a gene in a proximate sense is to contribute in a certain way to the structure of the organism, the organization of the organism. While there's a completely different sort of level, uh, which he calls ultimate causes, which answer the question, why? Okay. Why did wings evolve? They are for flying. Okay, and the, the sort of uh, explanations here are very different from the functional explanations uh, on the left-hand side. So Meyer is saying, um, you can totally cleanly separate this two. Uh, and these, his different causes, of course, just like Aristotle's different causes, are more ex different explanations. Explanations are answers to different questions in evolution. That's very important. They're not ontologically different causes. They're epistemologically different explanations. Okay, and this evolutionary sort of why is, is very sort of tricky, right? We know that because traits are for something. They have a function in the evolutionary sense. They, wings are for flying. And this smacks, of course, of teleology. So Meyer in the same paper introduces uh, this, this concept, or popularizes, I should say, it was introduced before by Pittendry and others. Uh, he, he popularizes this concept of uh, teleonomy, which is an apparent purposefulness or teleolo teleology of biological systems due to the evolution of genetic programs. It's only apparent because there is a deterministic genetic program that is being selected for. So if you have a deterministic genetic program and selection, you can get the impression that something has a purpose just because this prog program has been selected in the past for that particular activity. Okay, turns out to be not quite as simple. We'll see that in a minute. But it seems like a good start. So if we could subdivide the problems, they would become much easier. But that isn't really working. So let's have a look at this by taking one of the simplest sort of summaries of evolutionary uh, theory that you could get. There are several such summaries available in textbooks. Uh, Darwin had one in his um, uh, book, The Origin of Species. 
But the most famous, even more famous than Darwin's own, is Richard Lewontin's modern sort of summary of evolution by natural selection. So let's have a look at that. And Lewontin, in a paper, very famous paper, the first ever paper in the Annual Reviews of Ecology Systematics, um, writes the following. He says, as seen by present day evolutionists, Darwin's scheme embodies three simple principles. First, different individuals in the population have different morphologies, physiologies, or behaviors. So they have phenotypic variation. Second, different phenotypes have different rates of survival and reproduction in different environments. Differential fitness. And third, there is a correlation between parents and offspring in the contribution of each to future generations. So fitness must be heritable. There is a problem with this. You can think about it as, as sort of traits have to be heritable. It's not necessary. So fitness being heritable is more or less an indirect consequence sometimes of traits being heritable. Okay, these three principles embody the principle of evolution by natural selection. While they hold, a population will undergo evolutionary change. Okay, it is very simple. Variation, phenotypic variation, fitness, uh, differences, and uh, heritability. Okay, so you get evolution. Now, here, even with the simplest of all possible definitions, you can see immediately that it's not only important that you get inheritance, and variation. But it's very important to know where this variation comes from. What is the structure of this variation? We need to have an explanation for that. But let's have a look at a slightly more sophisticated definition here. This is from John Endler's Natural Selection in the Wild. Um, and I've quoted from uh, Godfrey Smith's 2007 paper on the topic, which is absolutely excellent. So I like this, of course. Natural selection can be defined as a process in which, okay, so it's a process. It's a, a recipe for getting evolutionary change in this case. So if a population has variation among individuals in some attribute or trait, the variation, a consistent relationship between that trait and mating ability, fertilizing ability, fertility, fecundity, or similar, not quite the same, and or survivorship, then you get fitness differences. Okay, then you can have selection. A consistent relationship for that trait between parents and their offspring. So that's what I said before, you have to close the life cycle, which is at least partially independent of common environmental effects. So you need to have some sort of inheritance, at least partially independent of common environmental effects. So there's developmental plasticity that affects this closure of the life cycle, but we have to have some sort of fidelity in traits being propagated across generations, of course. Then, the trait frequency distribution will differ among each classes of life history stages. So that's important. Of course, you have to uh, not um, compare apples with oranges beyond that expected from ontogeny. If the population is not at equilibrium, then the trait distribution of all offspring in the population will be predictably different from that of all parents. Beyond that expected from conditions E1 and E3 alone. So only variation and inheritance also can give you evolution. But this is evolution by natural selection. And he says conditions E1, E2, and E3 are necessary and sufficient for natural selection to occur. And these lead to deductions E4 and E5. As a result of this process, but not necessarily, the trait distribution may change in a predictable way over many generations. This is beautiful. These summaries show you that the core of evolutionary theory, evolution by natural selection, can be formalized. First of all, this is an informal description, but it, is, it takes the form of a, a logical argument. So natural selection can be entailed by this sort of argument, but that the details are quite difficult. So there's always counterexample to this sort of simple um, definition, but let's take it um, at the moment and take from this one thing, both of these very simple definitions of what evolutionary theory is, make it very clear that variation, the source of variation is of utmost importance. You can make this even more simple. Here's Eliot Sober. In his book, The Nature of Selection. And he says, there's, he calls his, his Darwinian general principle. If there is heritable variation in fitness, then there will be evolution. This is the shortest summary I found of evolutionary theory so far. And it captures pretty much everything these two earlier summaries have captured. Then Eliot Sober says, from this simplest of all possible definitions of evolutionary theory, you immediately see that there's two sides of the coin. And he calls them, and I find this very, very uh, useful, this distinction. He calls them source laws, 
uh, which describe the circumstances that produce heritable fitness variations. So these are the topics of physiology, metabolism, development, ecology, and consequence laws. They describe how heritable variation in fitness, once it exists, leads to change. And that is population genetics and the theory of drift and selection. Okay, so I don't like laws, of course, you know that. So I would say, let's call those source rules and consequent rules, because there are no laws in biology, especially not on the source size side. We, we may argue that, you know, evolution by natural selection amounts to some sort of law. But we have seen in the first part of the lecture that it doesn't, there's no such thing in development. So specifying source laws for natural selection, he says, is one of the major tasks of evolutionary biology. So if, if somebody says, developmental biology is not part of evolutionary biology, that is just stupid. Okay, so let's put it another way. Why does your laptop not evolve? Okay, so why, if you take any sort of component, you know, or interaction between components in your laptop and you randomly change them, you mutate them. Is the laptop likely to get better? Absolutely not. It's gonna get worse because it is an engineered object. It's been optimized for its function and it will not get better in any case, okay? So here's a problem, which is called the representation problem. The process of adaptation can proceed only to the extent that favorable mutations occur. Uh, for selection to work on. And this depends on how genetic variation maps onto phenotypic variation. So this is another argument of why you have to look at development to understand evolution. Because, of course, ontogenesis and phylogenesis are the same process, intertwined at different time scales. And so if you only study phylogenesis, you only look at the surface of what's happening, and you will never understand how much work natural selection is actually doing because you don't know what the structure is of your variation and if phenotypic variation is truly not directional or random in the sense of not contributing directly to the um, evolutionary change. So here it is again, the causal completeness principle. That's a third way of putting it from Amundsen's book, I'll share. Um, that I recommend it highly. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic history of Evo Devo. So the, uh, the causal completeness principle that goes back to all these very famous and, and excellent people here, uh, or maybe none of them, we don't know, it states uh, here in the words of, of Horder, in order to achieve a modification in adult form, evolution must modify the embryological processes responsible for that form. Therefore, an understanding of evolution requires an understanding of development. We can just substitute life cycle processes or any sort of ontogenesis, this broader concept of ontogenesis for development here. And that's true. We need to understand where the life cycle comes from to understand where the variation comes from. And of course, Waddington's metaphors were intended to guide such a research program already from uh, the 1940s onward. Um, and I can only recommend you read the strategy of the genes, but Waddington was, towards the end of his life, organizing these, these uh, conferences that were called Towards uh, Theoretical Biology. There are the preceding volumes of those uh, are absolutely excellent collections of um, uh, uh, papers. And, and Walpert's French Flag was one of them, for example. Another excellent one was uh, Jim Burns. Oh, before I move on, this is my master supervisor, Brian Goodwin, and a lot of excellent other people that you may uh, want to pick out and recognize here that attended the, I think this was the second uh, conference, actually. So uh, in one of those, uh, in 1970, Jim Burns um, publishes his famous concept of the genotype phenotype map. How does the quantitative phenotype arise from cellular components and the environment? So there must be a mapping between genotype and phenotype that connects biochemistry and population genetics. We've encountered this already. So this is repetition. And he writes in 1970, this is seriously complicated. Maybe, maybe it's non-feasible to understand. But now I think we can tackle this again, and we do. So what we need to know if we want to understand where variation comes from is we need to have an understanding of the genotype phenotype map, okay? And so uh, this is complicated because organismic and external environment feeds into it. It's not just a deterministic map. Um, it's doubly redundant. We've been through this, so there's the same genotype can give you different phenotypes uh, because of developmental plasticity or different genotypes can give you the same phenotype because of robustness. 
Uh, but what's really essential here is that the structure of this map determines the variational properties and hence the evolvability of a developmental system. And this is an essential part of understanding um, uh, uh, evolution. Let me put this in a very cartoonish way here. So basically, if you have a very straw man like naive version of population genetics, you have any kind of variation possible. Okay, so I'm drawing this as a sort of a phenotype space that is square here, and you have an isotropic distribution of different phenotypes. You get selection uh, that with an optimal phenotype here, and the whole population moves over here. But if you have a shape, an anisotropic shape, and limitations to this distribution, you may select for, you know, the optimal phenotype may be outside of what is possible for development to generate. And so what you get is a very different effect in this case um, for selection uh, of this trait. So this is how uh, the structure of the genotype phenotype map will uh, sort of play together with natural selection to create the evolutionary change. And again, by ontogeny, I include, I use this in a very broad sort of sense, including metabolism, physiology, development, ecology, behavior. So uh, this is a sort of a caricature of an adaptationist um, uh, view of evolution. And uh, this is an equally bad caricature of a structuralist, what's called a structuralist view of evolution. Amundsen's book uh, beautifully describes how for 200 years, these two sort of perspectives have, have been debating. But if we take a truly uh, serious perspective perspective is realism, we understand that they are just not asking the same questions, okay? So this led uh, in the 70s to this very famous paper um, by uh, uh, Jay Gould and, and, and uh, Richard Lewinton uh, in 1979, the Spandrels of San Marco and the Pan-Gaussian paradigm was a, an argument against um, ultra-adaptationist sort of approaches to evolution and for structuralist explanations. They were looking at the beautiful church of San Marco in Venice. Um, and in particular, they were looking at these structures, which they call spandrels. They're actually pendentive spandrels or the two dimensional version of this three dimensional structure, but never mind. So they were saying, look at these structures. The reason they're there is not because they have a particular function. The reason they're there is that there is this space that's created when you put a round dome on a square foundation. So it is there by geometrical necessity. But then the builders of the church used them in very beautiful ways. They, they made these beautiful mosaics uh, in those spaces. So basically this is how evolution works. Pendentives or spandrels in their paper are not adaptive per se. So this is the Panglossian paradigm. Pa Dr. Pangloss is uh, Voltaire's caricature of Leibniz who said that we live in the best of all possible universes. So, so adaptation is to you, uh, sees biology as living in the best of all possible uh, universes. And these pendentives or spandrels are the consequences of structural constraints. But then they are sort of co-opted uh, into, uh, exapted into the evolutionary process. They're there, so they're being used by evolution as the tinkerer. Okay, so this is one of the most famous, and I highly recommend you read this paper, Arguments Against Pan-Adaptationism, Panglossianism, um, for a structural sort of account. So this is very important. So structuralist accounts explain the structure uh, of phenotypic variation, and they are an essential part of explaining evolution, uh, evolutionary change. And you can sort of conceptualize them either as constraints, you can say, okay, we could have all this variation, but it's no longer possible because we have development. So you could say a developmental constraint is a bias on the production of variant phenotypes or a limitation on phenotypic variability caused by the structure, character, composition, or dynamics of the developmental system. But this is sort of upside down because what's really happening is that um, development doesn't constrain, it produces the variation in the first place. Here is Gunter Wagner and Lee Altenberg writing uh, in, in this absolute uh, classic, uh, the variational properties of the phenotype are fundamental to its evolution by natural selection. Adaptation requires that genetic change be able to produce adaptive phenotypic changes. Whether or not adaptive changes can be produced depends critically on the genotype phenotype map. These variational properties, they show up in different uh, guises in the literature. They're called variational tendencies, uh, developmental drive, and they were reinvented as variational properties in this paper by 
is Ak Salazar Ciudad, and he has a brilliant quote here that brings everything to the point. Development free evolution cannot exist. Development does not impose a limit or constraint on evolution, but on the contrary, allows it to happen in the first place through the production of morphological variation. So development ontogenesis is the flip side of the phylogenesis part of evolution and hugely uh, complicates it. This is, as we will see, why evolutionary theorists excluded it in the first place, because it was too complicated to deal with. So this very complicated structure of the genotype phenotype map is what we need to explain. And uh, there are ways of explaining it using uh, statistical approaches, quantitative genetics, genome-wide association studies, but as usual, I want a causal processual explanation. We've discussed this uh, exhaustively during the first part of the course. So what we need is the whole toolkit of the first part of the course uh, to explain what Waddington calls the epigenotype, so the, the shape of the trajectory. This is a common theme. It comes back and back. I may be flogging a dead horse here, but I'm repeating this. What we want to explain is the shape of these developmental trajectories that re represent the generative processes that produce the variation. Waddington calls this diachronic biology, biology extended in time. So the phenotypes don't, are not some sort of static thing, but they're processes. An organization of matter together with principles of directed or asymmetric time-dependent transformation. These are the generative principle, principles. We've seen that they are uh, morphogenetic fields. This is what we need to, to study, to understand, to understand evolution, not just development. Okay, for example, this diagram that I've shown you before as well. Why do you have discrete clusters of phenotypes? Because development is only producing certain discrete phenotypes. There are no intermediate forms. There are no constraints here. This is all there is. This is, the, these are the variational properties and they, they lead to these very sort of non-isotropic and sometimes disjoint distributions of phenotypes. You can get polyphenism, uh, phenotypic plasticity. And of course, and we've also been over this in, in the, the lecture about bifurcations, if you, if you know the probability of these different um, transformations that you can uh, undergo uh, because you understand the underlying process, then you can draw these transformational diagrams and you, you can sort of say, okay, we have here the map of the possible on which selection can act, okay? So this Basically, we've covered a lot of this in the first part, but this is very important in an evolutionary context. It is half of evolutionary theory, because what we need to do is we need to explain the genotype, phenotype, and of course also fitness map. And this is a beautiful drawing from Oster and Alberg's paper in 1982, where you can see they've introduced Waddington's epigenotype, the space where these generative processes, these morphogenetic fields, where they live uh, here in, in, in this sort of, level of the developmental parameters that uh, uh, bridge uh, genotype and phenotype. In fact, I've shown you in my lecture about causality that there are many, many different levels here, levels of organization in between. And we need to look this, at this as a multi-level dynamical, complex dynamical system. Okay, so this is what we need to focus on. Now we've covered a lot of this in the first part of, of the course. We'll revisit that though, when we look at this different sort of process versus replicator perspectives on evolution and so on and so forth. So keep this in mind, it'll come back to us. Um, and the whole sort of argument here results to this fact that you can have population level explanations of evolution by natural selection, but you can also have different kinds of, of explanation. And uh, Brett well, uh, Calcock here um, argues that what we do especially in evolutionary systems biology and evolutionary developmental biology, Evo Devo explains something completely different. What we want is not a sort of a change in alleles in the population, but um, from this map of the possible, we can uh, infer plausible evolutionary paths. And uh, Calcott calls this lineage explanation. It's quite simple. So you have a mechanism that produces some sort of shape or form or developmental process. That's the production dimension you have an evolutionary dimension continuity. And in evolution, you're only allowed to change one sort of letter at a time here, where you're looking at the evolution of an English word into another English word. And all the intermediates need to be functional. They also need to be valid um, uh, words in the English language. And you can only change one letter at a time. And what you see is this process here. You have a generation 
algorithm that produces the outcome, a functional word, and you have different mutations and, and it's easy to get from one to the other. And what you want to do in a lineage explanation is to uh, reconstruct the sequence of different changes in the mechanism that produces the outcome. Okay, if you have teenage boys at home, uh, it'll look slightly different. So here we go. You can do this with almost any combination of four letter words in the English language and it works. So this is quite amazing. So, but the bottom line here is that basically what a traditional sort of evolutionary theory in a narrow sense, natural selection, population genetics tries to do, and what uh, Evo Devo or evolutionary systems biology try to do are two different perspectives on evolution. Okay. So the adaptation is, uh, in the words of Ron Amundsen, or maybe just evolutionary geneticists, says that individuals don't evolve, populations do. Species are effects of the evolution of populations. That's one framework. And then the structuralist says individuals don't evolve, ontogenies do. Remember, that's the whole life cycle. Characters are effects of the evolution of ontogenies. That's a different perspective, and it's equally valid to the first one. They are complementary. They don't contradict each other at all. You need both flip sides of the coin to understand evolution. And we'll come, not in the next uh, module, but after that, to bullshit discussions in evolution. And there are many of them because people don't understand that they're looking at the same process, but they're asking different questions. So they don't have to argue who's right and who's wrong because they're both right or both wrong. Who knows, right? And they're just sort of talking past each other all the time. But before we get back to that, I want to move on. And, and in the next lecture, I want to look at how does this affect uh, evolutionary innovation? So one of the things that uh, Evo Devo and, and evolutionary systems biology can contribute to evolutionary theory concretely is the source of novelty, which you cannot look at in population genetics alone, because that is a classical sort of physics in a box approach. We'll come to that next lecture. I hope you tune in again uh, next time and uh, wish you a nice evening. Goodbye.